The following is an interview with Vernon Howard by Michael Toms of New Dimensions. Vernon, the nature of your work involves change, and I'm wondering what you feel is the most important change that's necessary for us today. First of all, we have to see what spiritual change is not. And spiritual or inner change is not getting a new excitement about a new philosophy or reading a new book or moving to another place to join some society or philosophical organization. Self-change means just that, a very drastic whole change in the way you think, in the way you look at the world, in the way you look at yourself. And if we could, we could talk all night on that subject alone as to the way we look at ourselves. And when we're younger, we look at ourselves in a wrong way. We look at ourselves as being weak and we want to be strong. Or we look at ourselves as being unsuccessful and we want to be, uns and we want to be successful. But all these are worldly terms, for example, wanting to be successful. Now, what on earth does that mean? Uh, there are millions of people who have made a lot of money, who have been socially successful, who are famous, and they're miserable. Change, to answer your question. Change means to change in a way that you are in control of yourself therefore in control of everything that happens to you, whether you're a, a millionaire or don't, don't have a penny, or whether you're famous or a nobody, so that you don't care what the world thinks about you or what even your own images say. You're content with being who you really are, and that's a long, hard, but extremely rewarding adventure. Vernon, many people feel powerless, uh, particularly in a, a media age when everyone is surrounded by the problems of the world. Uh, in very real ways, that there's a sense of uh, oppression and being pressed down and depression. And what about that powerlessness that that many individuals have about how they, how can I possibly change yes, all yes, of this yes, massive yes, problem? Yes. Here's an interesting situation. People feel, indeed, they feel powerless and helpless in the face of society in the face of oppression right in the own family, for example. And they make a mistake. The mistake they make is they say, all right, I'm helpless now, you've got me now, but someday I'm going to be the person in power. I'm going to be rich or I'm going to be in authority somewhere. They don't realize that they've made the mistake of their lives because once they, even if they get these positions, they're not going to feel any different inwardly. They're still going to feel helpless because they haven't changed their nature. Now, here's a very radical, but what a beautiful and wholesome, different attitude toward feeling helpless. When you're helpless, stay helpless. Stay powerless. Don't do a thing about it. Because if you do a thing about it, your egotism is activated, and now you become a Hitler, a tyrant, in your own mind, and you're saying, just wait till it's my turn to conquer the world. Then all you people who have hurt me, I'm going to get revenge. This is neurosis. This is sickness. But if you say, all right, I feel helpless, I'm going to understand exactly what feels helpless. And if you investigate it long enough, you'll find out that it's your own neurosis that feels helpless because it wants to have domination and tyranny over others. If you go way beyond that stage, you finally find that you're not helpless at all in the, in the face of this tyrannical world, which it is, this horrible world, which is a destructive world. You don't feel helpless at all because you're not fighting it. And what doesn't fight it but a new spirit, a new nature that's inside of you that has conquered the world because it's not trying to conquer it. It's above it. See two um, armies fighting down on the battlefield and almost every human being will join either Army A or Army B. We're saying get off the battlefield altogether and stand up on the hill above them and watch those poor pathetic human beings wanting to get rich and famous destroying each other. And any time any foolish human soldier wants, he can leave either army and walk up on the hill and be a free spirit. This is true religion and true liberty. Does this change perception produce a change in the world? No, it changes you. And you find out very early, as you make progress, you find out that just as you didn't want reality, didn't want truth, didn't want hard work on yourself, the world doesn't want it at all. 
The world wants to pretend that it's in charge. It wants to pretend that it can change things. And all it does is move from one corner of the jungle to another corner, but it's still in the jungle. So is the job then to escape the world? You escape the world by escaping your own sickness. Where, where is the sickness of the world but in me or in you or in some other person? Look, if you're healthy and you walk into a hospital where there are 300 sick people, if you are healthy, what does their sickness have to do with you even though you're in the hospital itself? It has nothing to do with you. But you have to reach this state to understand what I just said. Otherwise, you might go into the, a person might go into the hospital and be very sick himself, but, he, but he'll claim to be a doctor who can cure other people, and he's deceiving both himself and the other person, isn't he? So we have to see self-deception in ourselves, make sure that we see ourselves as we are, which is as a patient. And with that very, very right beginning of calling yourself a patient, you can then begin to see that you are sick, then you can call for help from the higher physician, and the prayer will be answered. Well, I want to go deeper with this world question. Is, is the, do you necessarily see the world as an evil place, as something to get out of, or, or is it possible for it to, to be different? It is not possible for the world as a mass to be different because the masses of human beings have chosen wars as the way of life. They have chosen crimes as a way of life. They have chosen self-pity and self-centeredness and egotism as their way. All authentic religious teachings from thousands of years ago up till now all teach that you can be in this world but not of it. And that's what that's talking about. See. We're, we're so mixed up and so, so conceited. We think we can save the world when we can't even save ourselves from our own worry, from our own vanity. Save yourself. And then the whole idea of saving the world will take on a different viewpoint. And you'll understand something that's very shocking at first, but the sooner you see it, the better. Most people don't want the truth. They don't want to be rescued from their own self-centeredness because they would rather live in the illusions that they know more than God himself and their lives get darker and drearier as they grow older and they grow scareder. Only one thing that can save them, and that is for them to honestly see themselves the way they are and then call upon help. Vernon, you do lectures, you produce tapes of lectures and distribute them, you publish books. What led you into doing the work you're doing now? How did you get into it? I've already described it up to a point when I said you have to look at our own lives and it would be an individual, myself included, who was brought up into this world and at an early age started to look, look around and see the kind of people that surround you. See, for example, a young man might meet a, another man who's moderately successful in something, a shopkeeper, and this man starts boasting that you should also be a shopkeeper because look at me, how successful I am. And we begin to see that everybody is deceiving you based on their own insecurity. And you look around and see how scared everyone, including your own parents, including all the people who are supposed to be the leaders of the world. The saviors of the world are just as scared as everyone else. And you sit back and you look at them and you see them, you see the advisor nervously drumming his finger on the table and you know he doesn't even know he's doing that, that he's doing it unconsciously. And you begin to understand something that, again, that's very frightening at first. You begin to see that all the people you have been going to for help desperately need help themselves. And the reason that's so frightening is because you don't know where you're going to turn next. But if you will stay with the emptiness and don't call on these human helpers, don't, and don't fall into the vanity of thinking you understand higher truth when you don't, you'll go through a certain stage which is often described as the valley of the shadow of fear or whatever, in which all your illusions and pretenses are beginning to be destroyed. And on the other side of that dark valley, you'll find what is authentically real, what is called God, what is called tr a true spiritual religion. So, somewhere in your life, you found this particular way for yourself. Yes, I have described my own journey when I spoke earlier about that, and it's much more detailed than that. For example, you, you begin to see how 
again, how people who are supposed to know the answers, how they even fight among themselves. And, and they argue and say, I know the answer. And the other one says, you don't, I know the answers. The fighting between religious groups and philosophical groups. And begin to say, if these people fight, how can a fighter or a person with hatred in him know the truth? How can that be love, for example? And so, again, you start to tremble and you say, well... If this, if this is the best this world has to offer, what am I going to do next if I want out? And that's where the real spiritual journey starts, where you have to look inside yourself and see, never mind the fighters out there. See the fighter in you. Admit that it's there and yield yourself to reality. And the change comes to you. You begin to see what good does it do to have a million dollars and be miserable. Or to, be, or to be famous, or to be influential, and still have all this terror, for example, of the future inside you. And your mind begins to work better. It begins to get really logical. And you begin to see that giving up your egotistical life is the only thing that will give you eternal life, real life. And you'll fight that as I fought it for many, many years, because we're afraid to give up our egotistical life, because it's the only thing we have. Finally, we see the necessity. Isn't that largely an Eastern philosophical view uh, that comes out of the religions of the East that one has to get rid of the ego uh, in order to find the truth? It's also a very prominent New Testament teaching. And what, what difference does it make where it comes from, of course, the source, whether it's East, West, or a book? Isn't it a fact that makes sense to you personally? Doesn't it make enormous sense for any of us to say, all right, I'm behaving in a certain way. I'm hostile, I'm antagonistic, and I have nightmares. Now, doesn't it make sense to say, in order to have something new, I must first give up the old. All right, what I have to give up is my need for anger. And anger supplies a certain false need. For example, I'm the big powerful man who can make a woman cry. And when you, when you see that this is false life, you understand that the false has to go before the truth can come. You have to empty the cupboard out of the old groceries before you can put the new ones in. In your own catharsis, in your own discovery of these principles that uh, you're now expounding, did you find any authentic uh, spiritual teachers in that process? I found a number of threads that ran through books, lectures, and this thread, including the New Testament. And this thread was common to all of them. And one of the threads was what we just discussed, that the old has to go before the new can appear. And also the idea of the, the prominent idea of honest self-facing. So all these threads ran through each of these, which was the only thing I was interested in. Because after a while, you can begin to separate tr a true book from a false book, or a true teacher from a false teacher. Because you know very well that any teacher who deceives a listener must be a false teacher. For example, one who sympathizes with a hearer and says, it's not your fault that you're in trouble, it's always someone else's fault. You know that's wrong. You know that any teacher who tells you to evade responsibility for yourself must be wrong. So it was the, the thread of, the golden thread of truth that you could pick out of in any book. And you could even see some books where a writer was writing the book mechanically and he mechanically put a truth down in there and you can separate what he put down mechanically from something that's all nonsense. Going back to my question, did you find any living authentic spiritual teachers besides those you found in literature? I would rather not give names if you don't mind and there's a reason for that. I did. You did find yes, some? Yes, I prefer not to give names because sure. I know what reaction would come if uh -huh. I did that. So there are some authentic yes, spiritual yes. teachers around. Yes, yes, a few, very few, and a lot in the past. Christ, for example, was a true teacher. Are there other examples from the past that you can mention? I would rather not mention other names other than those of a long, long time ago. Buddha knew the truth. And by the way, if anyone's interested enough in doing it, you take the teachings of Buddha and of Christ and of a few other teach ball player and you got very proud of it and you had your letter and the girls chased you and all that. He, or the girl gets chased by the boys because she's pretty and something. So we build images of ourselves and we take these pictures as being us. Now this is egotism. When we begin to see that, that our 
identity is nothing but an accumulation and a package of I, hundreds and thousands of ideas about ourselves, even tragic ones, like you got into trouble with the law, for example, now you call yourself a criminal, you've got an identity of a criminal, right? These thousands of images, we take these as being our real self. And it's it gets so solid and so hard that few people ever break through because they're afraid that you're going to take true life away from them. And all we're trying to do, all God is trying to do, is take away the misery caused by your mass of false identities. Now, when you suspect the truth of all this, investigate it and work on it, you begin to see something marvelous. You begin to see that the faster you can work to get rid of your pseudo-identity, the better you are because you're tossing out the junk which will finally make room for jewels. And here's one problem just briefly. People are, are afraid of what's ahead of them when they get, to get rid of their egotism. They say, but what will replace the pseudo-me that I have now? You must never ask that question because you'll just invent another one very cunningly, like the alcoholic who becomes a preacher. He has simply changed his identities and not his nature. And few, few people ever see that, even the experts. We're saying, when you see what truth has to give you as a reality, when you suspect it in a small way, you'll want to go so fast to get rid of your uh, illusory identities that you'll work real hard on yourself. Then, truth itself will give you a new identity which is not of the mind, which is not calling yourself anything. To call yourself anything is to be in trouble. And you'll understand this when you understand that the mind cannot save you. You must go above it and beyond it. And when you go beyond your own mind, which is going beyond your old, old accumulated identities, God has a chance to send his spirit down and instruct you. And then you'll live from the spirit instead of from your faulty mind. And that is a free life. Vernon, what, uh, you mentioned you bring up God. Uh, do you see God as a personal being? If you do that, then you'll bring in a lot of human characteristics that God has. So it's best not to do that. It's best to simply use the word, knowing that it is a word. And then the spirit that I talked about, the spirit will know who God is without describing him according to past religious conditioning, which is, which is terrible. You know, the, the furious God or the God who's going to bless you for giving money to charity. All that is a part of the delusion. Know that God at first is just the word. Don't take the word as being God. It's just a word, isn't it? And an idea about God is not God. God is not your idea or my idea. You know, this is why religions fight with each other, don't they? Each man has his own idea of what God is. God is not an idea. He's a spirit, an invisible spirit. And when you see that, then you can use words like God all you want, but you know that you're using them as descriptions, not as realities. Fernand, does traditional religion, uh, traditional religious structures offer uh, anything to the person who's searching for the deeper side of themselves? It offers it only to the person who is tired of being tired. A person can go to any kind of a group and if he's very watchful, he can bring all these principles in that we've talked about. Look, look, you go to a church, you go to a philosophical group, and you go in there saying, now I'm going to look at the realities in this room. No, I'm not going to, to hear what I want to hear. And so you look and you can see all around you people who are nervous, who are not aware of themselves, and you see everything wrong in there. At the same time, at the same time, maybe someone gives a truth, and he gives some little truth, like he says, well, we all, all must be responsible for ourselves. You recognize that as being right. And when you go out of there, you have an accumulation of facts that will help you to go to the next group and see even more until the time comes where you'll be able to decide instantly between a true group and a false group, a true book and a false book, because your own spirit is witnessing not your egotism and not your desires. So there is something to be obtained if one is open to it. If you go to any place at all and all you want to do is just sit and be lulled to sleep, then the only thing you'll get out of that is a deeper state of sleep for yourself.
You can use everything if you want to stay awake. Any situation. And you, the more you use the situations, the more you know which situations you should stay away from. Because you begin to find, find the truth in yourself instead of in a physical location. What about meditation? Well, it's a word, and meditation means whatever it means to you. I don't use the word in particular, rarely use the word, because I know that when you say it, out of the 200 people or more listening in an auditorium, each will associate with what the word means to him. So I stay away from that particular kind of word. However, what would be closely allied to the use of the word would be what we've talked about here, which is to constantly watch what's going on inside of you every minute, which I have been doing right while I'm talking to you. I'm aware of you being there, of my hands being down here, for example. So if you want to call awareness at the moment, that is, seeing what's going on at the moment's going on, then if you want to apply the word meditation or watchfulness to it, then that's fine. But the work is what's important, not the word you put on it to define it. So your concept of meditation would be as every part of life, not just going yes, off into a corner certainly. and... Bring everything in it, fearing nothing, walking around a room, walking around your own life, seeing what is going on and being so awake, so alert inside yourself that this light inside of you can't possibly be, be afraid of the darkness of the headlines on television or a, a drastic uh, dreary story, a tragic story of some kind. So you don't take the world inside yourself because the darkness of the world can't come into your light. And then that, that's again what's called being in this world but not of it. And you, you've, you've conquered the whole world because you've conquered the dark world inside yourself. Now you can be like Daniel and walk in the cage of lions and they can growl at you and they can snarl at you and put their claws out at you, but they can't hurt you. You can walk from one, you go in the cage, make a big circle around, walk in between the lions a dozen times and they will snarl, they will snap at you because that's their nature, but they can't bite you. They cannot possibly hurt you because they sense that they have no power over the truth, over reality. And lots of human beings are angry lions, aren't they? Wouldn't it be nice to be free of all of them? It's possible. I'm speaking with Vernon Howard. Vernon, we were, you were touching on the cultural conditioning that occurs uh, in our society with uh, most of us. And one of the things that, that strikes me is that there's a tremendous pressure um, on young people today and, and uh, for young people for a long time of being successful of making it in in real life terms and that means um, getting a good job and having a career and making lots of money and and being acknowledged by one's peers etc how do you feel about that drive for success that so permeates our society well not only young people but older people should just sometimes sit there and when they take that kind of an attitude, the only thing that's ever going to rescue them is the seeing of their own pain while asleep. We put up a new sign outside of our door where people exit, and the sign says, when the pain gets too bad, come back. Because people go away say, well, that's nothing new. I've heard everything you've said before. I already understand it. If they remember that phrase, when the pain gets too bad, come back, when the pain does get too back, it's going to too bad. They're going to remember where they heard it, perhaps, and come back, and they can come back and start all over again. Most do not, by the way. Most people, when they leave, they leave, and that's the end of it. Well, you're not suggesting that the only place they can find this kind of uh, solace or transformation is here. I mean, people can find it elsewhere, can't they? I'm saying this. This place is a place where you can find truth. Whether there are other places or not is not our concern. I'm, I'm sure there are. Most certainly there are. We're not saying that we're the only place that has truth. I will say that if you've come here and you recognize the truth, you'd better stick close because your, your life depends on it. And it's not Vernon's truth. It's not the truth of the particular group that we have. It's the truth that's eternal. And anyone who comes long enough and comes, comes long enough to be what he calls being insulted over and over again, 
you finally will see that it's not insult at all, but the, the only authentic love there is in the world. And which we're telling you, now look, if you, want, if you want to remain a hostile and lost person, that is up to you. That's your life. You can do anything you want with it. But if you've come here and you've sensed that we have described your misery correctly, your lostness correctly, then also think that perhaps the truth that you hear in this room is also right about the solution. So come back and the same time that we give you what you call insults, which is merely revelations of what you've always been, if you'll come back long enough, you'll begin to see that they're not insults at all, but healing medicine. And a person will begin to change. And we have had a lot of people and do have a lot of people who have gone through this very rough but beautiful process. They're in our group today. Going back for a moment to uh, the achievement of success in one's career, um, m many of us tend to be locked in to situations. We feel we're locked into situations in the sense that we may have a career position, we have a vacation and a retirement plan and a car and an expense account, etc., etc. And you're suggesting that perhaps if that isn't the way, that there may be another way and then one would have to give up those uh, attachments, those things that we identify as being uh, real in this life. Um, wouldn't that be pretty difficult for most people? We never ask anyone to quit your employment, whatever it is. We don't ask them to change your family life, never. What we say to them is you, whatever you're doing now, whatever you're working at now, whatever your career or non-career is, we're asking you to pay attention to your inner life. Don't try to change the outer. If you change the outer without changing the inner, you're not changing anything, and you'll just get into another bad marriage, you'll just get into another financial disaster, because you, your mind hasn't cleared, your spirit isn't more intelligent. We're saying, make yourself right inwardly, and that will naturally take care of the outer, and that's not just philosophy. People very often think, oh, that's a nice thing to say, but let me tell you and everyone listening that nothing is more practical than the truth that if you will go to work and change the way you think, the way you see life, the way you feel, if you change that without effort, automatically your exterior life will change too. It must, because the inner now becomes the grand commander to changing things on the outside. And you'll lose a lot of friends that you wish that you'd lost a long time ago, maybe. Friends that you thought were friends who were actually harming you. But they were desperate and they used you and you used them. You finally understood how mutual exploitation goes on in this world and what a terrible thing it is for everyone. You begin to set yourself free inwardly and that automatically sets you free outwardly. That brings me to uh, another question I have for you and that is the whole issue of relationship. Our relationship, not only to ourselves but to those around us, particularly those closest to us. And why do you see that, that frequently what happens is that people are um, angry or express hostility to those closest to them, either in their own family um, or close friends. That kind of thing seems to be something that happens sure. quite often. It's the most common thing in, on earth. People are unhappy with their spouse and with their children and their parents and everyone else simply because they're unhappy with themselves. They have told themselves something like the following. I have the answer. The answer is to have this family, to have this occupation or whatever. Now having told themselves that this is the way to be happy, they don't feel happy. Their words don't match their feeling and this uh, brings up irritation, the smoldering volcano. And a person who is lost, who is a volcano, he doesn't care who he spills his lava out onto, and it, and it is his wife or his children or whatever. It's his unhappiness spilling out. The only solution to him is to rescue himself. Then he'll never ever be, un ever be able to be unkind to anyone else. How does one deepen one's relationship with another human being? Wake up yourself. I, I'm aware that when you ask me these questions that I always come back to the same answer because it's the only answer, and we can express it in different ways. Wouldn't you agree that a person who is angry, who goes around causing trouble to other people, wouldn't you agree, look, let's use the word, wouldn't you agree that he's lost? And, the, and if he's unhappy, he's going to crab at his wife. 
the wife is going to snap at her husband. And there's no way to change it by using words, by saying, okay, let's be nicer to each other tomorrow. You're going to hurt each other tomorrow because your nature hasn't changed. This whole business of what we're talking about is changing me, changing my nature drastically so that I am not my own worst enemy. Everyone is their own worst enemy. You know that. We're trying to change that. So the Spirit of God is our only friend. And this is a reality, not philosophy again. Vernon, I want to go out from the microcosm, namely the individual, to the macrocosm, the larger reality. Do the principles that you're talking about also apply, say, in the case of nations relating to one another? Like I was thinking as you were talking about, um, well, it's not just uh, coming up with a new peace treaty are not coming up with just a new way of, re of dealing with one another, but it's much deeper than that. Oh, Do these yes. principles go out to the larger? Oh. If, if the world could only see it, but the world doesn't want to see it. And here's the mistake they make. Do you know there's no such thing as government? You know, there's no such thing as armies. There's no such thing as, as criminals. What there is, is individuals who have gone wrong. And we escape from that fact, we try to lose ourselves in it by saying it's the government's fault, it's crime's fault, it's war's fault. Well, what is the government but of individual human beings? What's an army but of the general and the privates and the corporals? What is criminals but this man here who r robs a house? No one wants to face the fact that it's the individual who does indeed make the whole world, what you were talking about, make the universe what it is. But everyone wants to lose themselves in the masses. The mob is always a coward. The crowd is always cowardly, always deceitful. And this is why people like to hang out with crowds who think just like they do, and now they can have a common enemy, can't they? And they can destroy each other, as in wars or in riots, for example. We're saying this. Now, come on now. Grow up. Wake up. And stop excusing your individual bad behavior and be a courageous, decent, honest individual who takes his individual responsibility for not thinking clearly, for being hostile, for striking out at the world, for being an egotist. Lying human beings sign peace treaties, and the next day they tear them up and go at each other's throats.
Why is it, Vernon, that uh, these kinds of, uh, the kinds of statements you're making and the kind of principles that you're talking about, we don't hear more often from uh, our political leaders? Because it would wreck their chance to be important in the government or in society. It would wreck their pursuit of egotistical aims by which they could pretend that they have succeeded in life in being someone. Every, every great man, every great leader goes to bed with nightmares, I'm telling you, and his wife too. But they won't face the fact that being important in the eyes of the world means nothing to their inner spirit. God is not mocked. God understands the game that all people are playing on themselves, not just the big famous politician, but everyone, the, the man in the small town who wants to become the most important man in town. Self-deception is actually impossible because you can't break the spiritual law that says you must be belong to truth or you must belong to the world. Take your choice which you want. If you choose the world, you're going to pay for it and you're going to get scared as you grow older. If you choose truth, you will grow innocent. You will, you will have, listen to this, you will finally have eternal life and you'll have it while you're right in this physical life because you have relinquished, given up the old nature which wants to hurt other people in order to believe falsely in itself. So the kingdom of heaven may be right here in front of us we just don't see it. It is indeed right in front of us. But we're afraid, we're afraid that it's going to take something important away from us. So our values have to change, don't they? We have to see how being neurotically suspicious that someone's going to steal something from them, that that's a destructive emotion. Take loneliness. Practically everyone is lonely, no matter how many friends they have around, they're lonely. Why can't a person sometimes sit down at the party with 80 other people prancing around with their drinks and confetti and sit down at the end of his couch and say, you know, here I am at this party and I've got a drink in my hand and there's a pretty girl over there <clears throat> that I'm going to talk to and yet I have a feeling of loneliness in me. Therefore, the party is not the answer and the drink is not the answer. Now, as you alluded to a minute ago, maybe he's going to stop looking outward to that girl or that party or that drink and he's going to see where the loneliness is and where the loneliness is is inner and that's where the solution has to be found inwardly. Now that man is getting smart. Vernon, I listened to one of your tapes where you related a story about a couple who uh, had belonged to a number of clubs and organizations and uh, became disenchanted over a period of time and uh, with had an inner gnawing, nagging problem with going to these meetings and eventually talked about it with one another uh, and found that they both shared the same view. And one of the things you said was that, that these people had recognized that the people in the group were their enemies. And I wanted you to explain what you meant by oh, that. Oh, yes. All lost people are enemies of other lost people because there's a conspiracy between lost people, sleeping people, people who love to live in gloom and anger. There's a conspiracy among all of them, no matter how close they may be socially, there's a conspiracy that says, you lie to me and I'll lie to you. Let's pretend that we're on the way to happiness. A few more years and our problems will be gone. So it's a conspiracy. So anyone can, who conspires against you finding the kingdom of heaven within is your enemy. It makes no difference who he is. But the real enemy is our is our inability to see our attraction to the outer enemy because it matches the enemy in us. When I see, for example, if I see that I'm exploiting another human being, getting what I want from, get money, get sex, or whatever I want, when I see that I am an enemy myself to that person, actually see it, and it's a shock, because I thought I was a nice person, see? And I get shocked by it. Ah, he is doing the same thing to me. It's a conspiracy, and it's my fault. Because I am responsible for seeing through myself, therefore responsible for seeing through him. I, I mentioned earlier that your friendships change and you, you see people so utterly different than you do because truth has become your friend, not people out there who want to use you as you were using them at one time. How do you see the truth? How do you understand the truth? And I realize that is a difficult question, but what insights can you share with people who say, well, I, I want to find the truth, but how do I find it? How do I see it? How do I know that, that this is the truth and this is not truth? Yes, yeah, sir. First of all, you do indeed have to come to a source where truth is being taught over a long period of time because our walls are so thick. But to answer your question more directly, truth 
is not a word. It's not a belief. It's not an idea. It's not a hope. Truth is nothing that the mind can create. Because egotism, which is also created in the mind, joins with your wish to get this or that. The egotism joins with your ideas about yourself, and therefore you're you take truth as being something that you create. Example, truth is the fact that I'm going to take a trip to Europe and I'm going to be happy. And it's an idea. And they take the trip to Europe and they're bored and they spend all that money and they come right back as miserable as they were before. Were before. So truth cannot be an idea. Therefore, God is not an idea. Reality is not an idea. When you see this, you begin to drop all ideas about reality, which cause conflict between religions, you drop ideas, and the only ideas you have are for practical purposes. You used practical ideas to set up this interview. You worked the mic and so on. Those are practical, nothing wrong with those. But when we use ideas to find God, we create God out of our own yearnings, our own desperations. Now here's the final word on that, and as you said, it's not easy to understand because the mind always twists things the way it wants to see things. When ideas about reality vanish, then reality enters the blank space that was left open for it. Now this must be personally experienced, and anyone who wants to go far enough can do that. Therefore, I am standing here using words talking with you now, knowing I can't show you the reality, but your own nature and the nature of anyone else can see it through their own surrender to truth. But you must come to the end of your intellect. And when you do that, something else enters. So you have to learn how to uh, go past your head and get in touch with that's right. your heart. Perhaps. Sure, that's fine. Right. That's a good way to put it, yes. Uh -huh. Right. A long journey and shocking, because we, we think we're so nice we describe ourselves so nice, and we see that we're not so nice. All right, why don't we do that? That's part of the healing. Don't we want to get healed? Are we going to, are we going to avoid the shocks so that we can hang on to our neurosis, or do we want to submit ourselves to the cosmic physician and get well? I want to get well. I want our group to get well. And there's, there's not a whole lot of support for uh, getting for. I feel this way. This is how I feel. And against that, there's the, well, this is the way it is, the rational, logical, linear dis definition or expression of what's happening or explanation of what's happening. And on the other side of that is, I feel a certain way. And you're suggesting that it may be more important to go with your feelings rather than to deal with the rational, logical, linear explanation. Well, way, way down, a thousand miles within a human being, there is a sensing of what is right and what is wrong. However, it has been so buried beneath the trash of conditioning, of ideas about success, about borrowed opinions as to what life is all about, that they don't get a chance to break through. This process, we're, the process that we're talking about, get all that junk out of the way, so at a certain point, it could come fairly early in the spiritual adventure, or it could come later, but a certain point, a person might be sitting at one of our meetings, for example, and a certain thing will be said, and that person will, oh, he'll go like, you know, not in out loud necessarily, but inside, secretly, invisibly, this little bit of a buried kingdom of heaven within suddenly comes alive, because he's made room for it. And, you know, that person is one of those persons you'll never be able to get away from our classes. He'll come an hour early in order to get more. He, he's, his hunger for what is real is beginning to be satisfied. And oh, he's not going to miss one morsel of truth. That's the way it works. But not with most people. Most people want to keep it covered up. Werner, why do you think we're here? To grow, to develop, to follow a certain plan of God who put us on earth to be something different as we mature, if we do, than we were when we came into the world. We come into the world very weak, very scared, very uh, gullible, susceptible to conditioning, to suggestion, very suggestible. A few human beings get fed up with suffering. 
We're not put here to, to suffer. We're put here to grow out of suffering. But people fall so much in love with their pains and anxieties that they won't give them up because they've taken them as their identity and they don't want to give themselves up. We see that these are mere identities and we're not going to have anything to do with suffering. It, we've seen through it. It's a hoax to us. You're not going to put that one over on me again of, of guilt, of shame, or of something terrible that we did 20 years ago. This, uh, these classes here will teach anyone how to cancel time, how to be free of shameful self-images. We always, I bring it out usually something like this. Remember that sex problem you had 10 years ago or that viciousness you had toward your ex-wife and you're ashamed of yourself? That's a part of your self-torment. When you're free, you cancel time and you're free right in the moment because you have a new identity, one that the mind doesn't create. And all the past identities of shame go away, which means you remember the event where you were very cruel, but there's no I in it. You, you're free. You've, you've put aside all your, future, your past identities and you're free in the present moment. Can people do this by themselves or do they need to have a, a, a spiritual teacher or a guide? They need, first of all, the truth itself, obviously. And then they do need as much help as they can get because it's, there's so many traps along the way. Most people, they, they come to our group and and they don't sense the reality of what's going on, and they fall into the first trap of saying to themselves many things. We have what we call braze, in which a person says, well, I've already heard that before, or why don't you give me something deep? I understood that 20 years ago. And here's the person sitting there shaking or crying or something, which means he's deceptive. You need all the help you can get. How does one go about finding that kind of help? Be honest and see that you're wandering around the face of this earth, not at home. See that you're not at home wherever you go. We'll teach you how to be at home, whether you're down to the busy marketplace or in a family life or right in the middle of your business occupation. You can be a free human being at home with yourself because you're not tied to what you're doing mechanically. You do mechanical work. You send out the business report down at your insurance office or wherever you are. At the same time, you know you're there and you're not saying, oh, I hope I make $1,000 this month because I've got so deeply into debt. You're standing there and when you get your paycheck, you pay for your house payments and you buy food and you let it go at that because money has no meaning to you beyond that. What has meaning to you is the kingdom of heaven and you've, you've sensed it and you've felt it and you were living in it and you know the impossibility of describing it to anyone else but you know the reality of it in yourself. So the kingdom of heaven can exist in an insurance office? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Or anywhere else on earth. It can exist in hell itself. Because you're not touched by fire. You're fireproof. Is there a right work? Is there a right uh, lifestyle, a right living? Yes, and it will be different for each individual because we are individuals physically, age-wise and all that. But there'd be one thing that's in common, and that's this thread of truth I talked about earlier, the thread of truth in which everybody knows the truth when you start talking about it. In our group, for example, when something is brought up, a uh, certain truth is brought up. I know, as I'm seated there, and I see slight nods of the head, I know that everyone out there is feeling the same thing because they've gone through this hard work that we've talked about, all sensing the same thing. So as you get more in touch with this deeper side of ourselves, which exists in all of us, one may change their, their work or their job or their lifestyle. Oh, yes. It does change a good deal on the... Uh, exterior you may want to you may indeed want to change your occupation but it is one thing it is never a problem with you because the message do this or do that comes to you you don't insist you follow now you're a follower of the truth instead of saying that you are the truth and events must follow you so you put yourself in a very beautiful and a very relaxed position where you're not demanding anything you don't have to demand anything because you have everything which is real life then if you change your home or your occupation or your friends it makes no difference because you're already settled at at home within your Yourself. Vernon, there isn't a whole lot of support for that kind of change. Very little. Most so, what does one do when there isn't a whole lot of support for that kind of change? Where does one find 
support systems that will allow and catalyze that kind of change while it's in transition? Oh, that's so simple. All a person has to do is say, do I want a million false friends and activities or do I want the one truth within myself? See, people, people want to lose themselves in activities and in other people. We're saying to find yourself, you have to cut yourself off as it comes to you naturally from all the activities that are preventing you from knowing who you really are. It's very simple. All you have to do is say, I am fed up with kidding myself and I am fed up with the world deceiving me because I see so clearly that they did. No, Michael, this is not popular. It's very unpopular, which is exactly why the world doesn't change, why you're going to continue to have wars, crimes, and all the heartache, Dude, and all the pain. That's kind of depressing, Vernon. Depressing. That's depressing. That, that oh, there, suppressing. That's so it's depressing to uh, think that it's going to continue to be black. Isn't there anything that I can do? Oh, yes. What you can do is be happy yourself. Then what you will give to the world is the cure instead of more poison. That's what you can do, I can do, other people can do. So there is a chance that it can change. Oh, yes. If enough people change. And let me tell you, this is kind of interesting. Interesting psychological point. Even if 1%, less than that, if one-fourth of 1% 1 of the human beings on Earth came to the light, found themselves, woke up from psychic sleep, the world would begin to change. Because there's a great deal of power in just a few million human beings who are awake. But it all begins at home. Begins with me, begins with you. Yeah. All right, we ask people when they come, there's one question we want to ask you as you come for the first time to this class. Are you tired enough? Are you tired enough of lying to yourself, of pretending that you know more than God? See, that'll hit people because this is what they're doing. They don't know it. We're telling them what they're doing. We understand what's going on out there because every single one of us came ourselves for the first time. And we knew how confused and how rebellious we were against the truth. So when we see a new person come, maybe a man will give, get up, and he's a big businessman, and he'll get up during the question and answer period, and he'll give a long, detailed speech about positive thinking, about conquering the world. Every one of, us, one of us sitting there sees through him, not with criticism or how superior we are, but that used to be me. That used to be that woman or that man, see? And so we understand them, and we understand what he has to go through, which is why we urge everyone, don't miss a meeting. So we create an idea of who we think we are. Yes. And it's usual, it's an illusion. Self-pictures. And they're like mental movies that we run through our minds where we're either the hero or the victim. Either one is okay because that gives me a false identity, right? And we alternate, don't we? One day I'm the conquering hero, the next day I'm the victim. Get rid of both sides of the opposites of the intellect. Vernon, at one time in your life you were in the place of that, say, that businessman or whatever. Yes, that's with right. With that false illusion. That's right. Uh, where are you now? Who are you now? I'm working hard on myself all the time, as I said, even while I'm talking to you now. And I'll tell you where I am. I'm climbing the side of the mountain, but I never say how high that mountain is. I never judge the peak. Because if I judge the peak, then my deception, if I went into it, would say, okay, I'm at the mountaintop, I know everything there is to learn. I know that I'm climbing the mountain, but I refuse to ever, ever, and never will say, I've reached the top. Look, look what I've done. I'm going to get new height every day, am I not? But if I say I've already reached the peak, I've settled for the level I'm at. And look, I climb 100 yards up the mountain, and if I deceive myself and say I've reached the mountaintop, lo and behold, the mountain is 100 miles high, and I've missed the beauties of up there because I kidded myself. No, we're going to just keep climbing all our life. Does the path ever go down, or does it just go up? No, not really. You can say you have little periods in which you doubt and all that, because you're still in the alternating states, and that does happen. But if you stick with it and come to class and get all the help you can, you'll see yourself, um, you go up five steps and slip back one. Then you go five and slip back one, but you're always going up. So you consider yourself still a student? Oh, yes. I'm a student of reality, and always will be. I've got to ask, what is reality? Reality is something that you can't think about, but that you can know and live from yourself, which is unexplainable with words. 
and reality is something that makes you a different kind of a person than you were when you were 10, 20, and 30, and you know it, because you can look back and see what you used to be and what a hell that was. And then you decided to get honest, and everything started to change. What about fear? As, as, as you've been talking, it's been occurring to me that a large part of many of the things that we've been talking about kind of at their root may be the fear, fear of, of change. We all want to, we all f feel comfortable with the status quo. Yes. And it's difficult to, to move, especially the kind of radical change that you're suggesting uh, in people's lives. What about that fear? How do we get over that fear? How do we get through that fear? Can you, can you imagine anyone being afraid to leave the lunatic asylum? That's the way it is. People live inside that lunatic asylum with their friends and with their fancies and with their madness and their greed. And they are indeed, you're quite right, they are indeed to, to leave the lunatic asylum because they're afraid that if they go outside they'll be in danger from lunatics. Here they are living in it and they think that the lunatics are outside when the lunatics are themselves. And no one wants to see where they're living, do they? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you say, wouldn't you, come on, wouldn't you agree that, that hate and fury is insane? Yes. Sure it is. All right. Now they have that, but they justify it, don't they? So a, a hateful person is in the lunatic asylum he, with himself and with many other inmates calling each other friends. See? So, <clears throat> but the fear, the fear is caused by the fear that we'll be seen through of exposure, of our phoniness. For the people in the lunatic asylum, they all have a label on themselves. One calls himself a man so spiritual that he can help other people climb the mountain of reality. Another person, maybe a woman, calls herself a darling mother and wife, and she's a, a good person, so good she, she belongs to a dozen clubs. You know, you know that woman has a lot of hatred in her, and she snaps at her husband, and she keeps it very well hidden when she goes to all her clubs. That woman is in, in terror that someone is going to see through her, especially herself. Because she senses that if she through, sees through her own phony self-pictures, then she's going to say, but if I'm not this, this person, that horrible person I see, then who will I be? So it's essentially the fear of death. But the most beautiful thing that can ever happen to any human being is to die to his sickness, to his images, to his phoniness. Die to that so that you can live and have eternal life. And anyone, anyone who will enter the dark tunnel and go through to the very end will have this everlasting life that teachers spoke about. Vernon, one of the things that uh, emerged particularly in the 70s was um, a deep interest in lots of the Eastern uh, religious approaches and there was an abundance of gurus that appeared on the scene in America and there was also the emergence of what's been called the human potential movement and many new approaches to personal growth and and all of that and in some in, in many in many cases it could be called the, uh, a candy store of consciousness choices and I'm wondering how you see your approach and what you do in the light of all of those th things that have been happening over the last decade, particularly in this society. Yes, it's quite true that many groups offer lollipops, and since most people are hungry for lollipops, they go to where they can get them. <clears throat> in our group, it is quite firm, very quietly firm, that you either come here to learn the truth or you don't. There's no halfway, there's no compromise. You can't impose your falsehoods on the truth. You come to a group like ours and you hear the facts of life. And to put it just as bluntly as I can, once a person is given the principles by which he can change his nature, he must either take it or leave it. There's no argument. There's no explaining to you in the explanations that you want. We say, here it is, take it or leave it. And most people leave it. The majority of people leave it. But that is not our concern. Now look, my concern and your concern and the concern of everyone who wants true life, concern is to do what is true, what is right, regardless of the consequences.
We, we are not going to sell our souls for doubling the population of our group every month. We're not going to sell it for the promise of someone who wants authority in the group and then hints that they'll donate $5,000 to us. We, we know too much to fall for that. We understand that. We understand that if we compromise, if we are weak, we are the ones who pay the price. And I personally don't intend to pay the price of that. I'm going to say this to myself. Now, I'm talking to myself just as much to anyone else. Truth... Even if it sounds like a cliché, we have to use words. Truth above all, regardless of what happens as a result of that. And then by taking that stand, we see that the results, while utterly different from what we thought they would be, are the very things that saves us from ourselves. Now what other groups do, that's up to them. Once in a while, we'll get someone into our class who has been to 50 groups, wandered around the country, churches, psychological groups, and they'll come in, and they will either stay or they won't stay. It all depends. But at least the pure truth has been set right before them, and the choice is theirs. Many of uh, these approaches and uh concerns, spiritual concerns particularly, have been called uh, narcissistic, and have been called that it's too much self-concern and it ex excludes mm -hmm. concern for social problems. How do you mm -hmm. see that? Well, we answered the question earlier, but we can go into it again. If you straighten yourself out, if you are no longer putting out hostility or deception, then you're putting... See how see it, easy it is to say that? You, you asked me, is it possible to contribute to the world? And I said, wake up. Now, what are you... And the listener is going to do with those two words, with an exclamation point behind it. Wake up. The first thing you can do is say that you're not awake. And if you're in pain, you're sound asleep. If you still think you have to be somebody, you're sound asleep. So in order to wake up, the first thing you have to see is that you're not awake. That you're sound asleep in your own vanity, your own trickery. And then it'll be different. You will be different, and then you'll be free. Listen to this. See how nice this is. Then you'll be free of false responsibilities and false duties toward the world. You know, people who say, okay, I'm going to give 20 barrels of rice to starving people overseas, there's a part of them that actually resents that because they know it is not real morality. Not that it's wrong to give food to hungry people. We're not talking about that. We're talking about something much higher than that. They get a sense of being good out of giving all this rice to starving people. And they resent it. They even may resent the money they put into it. And they resent having to use their car to go down to the wharf to send it over. A person could start with seeing how hemmed in, how imprisoned he is by false duties that he thinks he must do in order to earn his way to heaven. You're never going to make it. You're trying to buy your way into heaven by, by doing good while remaining bad. Can you see the difference in that, doing good while remaining bad? This is what the whole world is doing. We know that there's Red Cross and organizations like that. We're not talking about giving food to hungry people. We're talking about the individual who sees that his life is, is a wreck and wants to wake up. If there was one thing that you could tell people that they could do to transform their life, what would that one thing be? Have no fear in seeing through yourself. That's the start. And it can result in a beautiful finish. Have no fear in seeing through yourself. That says so much, doesn't it? Have no fear in seeing through yourself because the end result will be a beauty unimaginable, a new life. Vernon, on the other side of uh, the pain, on the other side of the suffering, uh, may lie enlightenment. And I'm wondering what enlightenment is in your terms. You have already described it in a way. Enlightenment, reality, the light, is an absence of everything you've ever known. Now, think of what you, or our listeners, have known all their life. The heartache of a broken marriage or the pain of not 
becoming the kind of a success you wanted to be. Now, can you imagine a life that is not that? Now, you can't do it because you can only see from the negative viewpoint. But you can start by seeing that reality is not delusion. Start with that. Now comes the work part. Now comes the part where you have to be willing to sacrifice your, your pain, your beloved suffering. People, people don't realize how much they're in love with their agony, with their tears. And if you take away the tears from the average person, you try to take away uh, tears from him and he'll lash out at you because you're taking away what he calls his reality. Such a person hasn't seen the answer to this question. What's wrong with being wrong? Listen to that now. What is wrong with being wrong? Now, conceit and vanity will immediately leap up and saying, well, what's wrong is that I am a person who is never wrong. You see how one lie has to follow another? We are not our delusions. If we can go through that and come out on the other side, you will know from yourself without descriptions and without thinking what reality is. And no one will ever have to explain it to you, and no one can explain it to you, because the kingdom of heaven within is very, very personal and very real. Expectations of what may happen. That is quite right, because those expectations are built out of your own insecure mind. And the insecure mind will set up prophecies of what should happen in order to keep the ego intact. So it's a false move, isn't it? And when a person prophesies that he's going to be successful tomorrow, he's scared. Because he's afraid the world isn't going to give it to him. Why not be successful now in the spiritual sense, and all else shall be added to you? Well, what does that mean, Bernie? That means that all the other things of life will come along normally and naturally because the light, truth, God knows how to run this world. Human beings don't, but truth does, and tr human beings will not give God a chance to run the world. It insists on making it a lunatic asylum, and truth isn't going to enter into that. But the individual who says, I want reality more than I want my sickness, he will begin to have a new kind of a life which is lived for him. Now, if anyone wants to know what I mean by that, I suggest you try it. I suggest you start at the very beginning, never, never fearing what happens to you, or if you have to fear, go ahead and fear. We give you permission to be afraid, because we know it's a false fear. We know the only thing you can ever lose is your pain and gain something that's eternal. Vernon, thank you very much. You're quite welcome.